Welcome to another episode of Surgeon's Lives. I'm your host, John Monson. My guest today is Professor Sir Norman Williams. Norman was born in Leeds and graduated from medical school in London. He spent periods of training in Bristol and Leeds, where he really hit his stride under the mentorship of Professor David Johnson. He became very well known for the work he did on the legacy specimens and documentation provided by the late Professor John Golliger. It wasn't long before stardom beckoned and he was uh, recruited to become the chair of surgery at St. Bartholomew's and subsequently the Royal London Hospital. He became politically active, culminating in presidency of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Post-presidency, he's continued to contribute as a key opinion leader in surgery and healthcare matters, being an advisor to multiple uh, government agencies over the last few years. I've known Norman for over 30 years, and so it was a great personal pleasure to reminisce with him, but most importantly to hear his views on leadership and how to affect change in the challenges of healthcare today. Without further ado, therefore, let's uh, listen to Professor Norman Williams. I'm John Monson, and this is Surgeons Lives. Uh, let me just, uh, oh, there you are, yeah. Oh, it's good to see you, Norman, after a long time. I haven't seen you face-to-face -face for years. Lucky how are you? <laughs> so um, I appreciate it's good afternoon to you, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm very grateful for you taking the time uh, to come and talk to me. This uh, You probably don't know anything about this, but it's a, a recent uh, podcast I started doing called Surgeons Lives. Um, and But the, the subtext or a strap line is stuff that matters. So in other words, what I've been trying to do is to um, talk to surgeons about their lives. And yes, of course, talk about the uh, CV and stuff like that, but also talk about the other things in their mind that um, press Hang on, their it's buttons. just gone off. Oh. oh. It's all right, it's back again. I don't it's know. Back. I, I've just got some new ones. I'm not quite au fait with them yet, so I don't know what happened there. You need a youngster with you to make sure that they're I being... Unfortunately, my son and daughter aren't here at the minute. They're not so young anymore. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, that's a little delusional of you. Um, so... Yeah, well, um, as you get to my age, you become delusional. <laughs> so um, what I normally ask people to do, and I will ask you to do, um, is to just... Uh, give um, the assembled masses a, a brief um, life story, starting with the words, I was born in. And the I was born in does not mean I'm asking for your date of birth. Um, uh, two people thought that, but most people understand that it says I was born in Leeds. Um, How do you know I was born in Leeds? I know a lot about you, Norman. You know? How do you really? <laughs> <laughs> well, how embarrassing is that? Well, I don't really know a lot about you, of course, but, um, you know, I don't know if you, uh, I recall vividly when we first met, you won't, um, but um, you may recall there was um, a live operating um, event um, in St. James's, Jimmy's, um, with three operating rooms going on at the same time. One was Peter Hawley doing an anal fistula in his magnificent star of stage and screen uh, performance as Peter is, you know? Yeah. The other it's was Tom. Turn the top on. Okay. It's, turn the top. it's not. Yeah. Go on. The other room was Tom Brennan. Um, yeah. The late, the late, great Tom Brennan. Um, and it'll come to me what he was doing. I can't. Oh yes. I know what he was doing. He was doing a Delorme. Um, and you were doing a post-anal repair, and I was designated as the new young Irish registrar to go in and help you and assist you. I know you. what's coming. I know what's coming. Well, you remember <laughs> it very well because yeah, the person... I, 
The monitor, if you recall, was John Gallagher um, yeah, 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 from yeah, the yeah. OR. And, yeah. <laughs> and I always remember, I'd never met you before. And what I remember was that um, this seemed a little unfair because, you know, Peter Hawley is a man who has never had a moment's self-doubt in his life, you know, and was flailing away at um, sphincter muscle in one side and... Tom was, you know, mumbling under his breath doing a Delorme. And there was poor Mr. Williams at that point, you know, being doing this thing with, with the legend saying, so what are you doing now, Norman? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. So talk about bringing back, um, you know, unhappy memories. Um, yeah, but uh, it's interesting how you can come back from, um, you know, adversity. <laughs> I always remember um um you know when it was all almost over and done with um you saying to me do you think do you think we should do a stoma um and <laughs> what I remember about that was me saying to you well um you know could do but if the camera comes back on and they f they come back and find us doing a stoma. I said, I don't think either of us will live it down. You know? <laughs> I think the patient did all right in the end. I, the patient did absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Anyway. But as you pointed out at the time, you know, probably most of the benefit of a post-anal repair was all the rummaging around behind causing fibrosis. <laughs> yeah. Good job as well. So back to I was born in Leeds. Yeah, it, uh, so uh, I was, and um, I was had a very happy childhood. I had an older brother who uh, used to look after me. He was about seven years older. Um, and I was very conscious from a very early age what I wanted to do in life, strangely. From about the age of about eight or nine, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Wow. And that was basically following, uh, watching a program called Your Lives, Your Lives in Their Hands, which um, was fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. And I remember uh, seeing all this gore and everything, and it didn't faze me at all. Worried my parents. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I uh, I knew that I re that's really what I wanted to do. And that was um, confirmed to me when I was about 12. I had an uncle that I used to spend a lot of time with in um, York, in Yorkshire countryside. He was a farmer, um, as well as many other things. He was an incredible character. I was very close to him. And uh, he went, he was... Broad Yorkshireman, he said to me one day, he said, so what do you want to do in your life, Norman? And I said, uh, I want to be a surgeon. And I knew he'd had an operation, but I hadn't got much of a clue at that age exactly what it was. And mm -hmm. the family never talked about it, as they often didn't in those days. And um, he took me into his bedroom, took off his shirt and showed me, well, I didn't know it at the time, but it was a colostomy. Um, I wasn't horrified at all, um, but he said, if you're going to be a surgeon, I want you to make sure that nobody else has a colostomy like I've got. I've got. So I was directed in that direction to become a color colorectal surgeon. <laughs> That's yeah, was, really the story. It's, a, it's an amazing story, actually. I was a little worried when you were said, and your uncle took you into his bedroom and took his shirt off for a <laughs> <Yeah>. moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's very, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable story, that, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that, yeah. and you, well, there was well, 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 no medicine of, in the family? Uh, no, none at all. Uh, but that's, I'm glad you asked that question, because many people thought I'd become a colorectal surgeon because of what my father did. My father was a paper merchant. He, he developed a company and um, one of his lines was uh, toilet rolls. And he was the first person in, my, in the business, as it were, to advertise toilet rolls on the television. And, <laughs> the, and the toilet rolls were called Wilvertex, 
And I, you know, and the strap line was guard against infection. Will the text is your protection? <laughs> but in those days, you couldn't show a toilet roll or a toilet or anything on the television uh, when you're advertising. You just could show, um, a, you know, the, the actual words. Um, and that was the advert. But I did not become a colorectal surgeon because, because of, that, of, the... of that reason. But a lot of people, particularly in the family, always thought I did, you know. So you, I mean, if he was advertising on TV, he 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 must have sold quite a few toilet rolls. Um, well, yeah, yeah, that's. I won't go into that. Um, but he had, he, he yeah, it, it's quite an interesting story. But I don't think it's appropriate. Well, for, uh, no, well, what I was getting at was so you you um you were born into some comfort and privilege. Uh, yeah, I mean, in comparison to a lot of people, yeah, yeah but it yeah. wasn't always like that. From yeah. my, I mean, mm -hmm. it was uh, we we were very humble, you know, to start with. It was typical. Sure. Um, you know, my father worked very, very, very hard. He was an incredibly hard worker, and he was very intelligent. But his his father died when he was sixteen, and he right. could have gone to university, etc. He was bright enough. But he had to go out to work yeah. uh, to mm. look after his mum and his uh, younger brother, who was very ill. Um, so he always, you know, encouraged me in education. And both of us, both my brother Ronnie and myself. Um, but um, he, yeah, um, when you say you brought having privilege, well, I can remember my earlier days where it wasn't so privileged. But he gradually got, you know. Yeah, everything. sure. Um, you know, made did quite well for himself, and obviously we were we we did well for ourselves. And you, so you spent all your formative educational years around in and around Leeds, round Hay, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah round Hay School. Yeah, I yeah. still see my old rugby friends. We have uh, lunch every two months um, with about eight guys uh, that I played rugby with throughout my career. It's interesting because the uh, you know you can't uh, pull the wool over uh, your uh, people's eyes who you've grown up with, and it's um, <laughs> and it's very entertaining. You know, as reminiscing about various things, and they're a good lot of guys actually, really good lot. And I would imagine also, I mean, it's it's um, it's a natural. Um, it's a natural old friends habit, but also a Yorkshire habit. Um, I would imagine they were simultaneously pleased for you, but deeply unimpressed by your knighthood. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my, oh, God, that never comes into the discussion. Yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, no, no, totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, nobody's, uh, no, not my close friends or family, I mean, Sure. Yeah. 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 Typical phlegmatic yeah, Yorkshire people. Um, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Doesn't wow them at all. Yeah. Yes. I and mean, it's, they, they, it's, good. Uh... it's good, in fact, John, because oh, yeah. know, it brings yeah. you down. You know, you, you've got to maintain your feet on the ground always. I mean, oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, uh, you know, when you were working in London, you know, you would have been. By definition, considered a la di da southerner at that point, you know. Very much so. <laughs> yeah, you needed a passport to go back. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, well, I still get ribbed about that now because sure. uh, some of those guys still are, are up in uh, the north. Sure. I love them. I love. I love the north. Obviously, growing oh, yeah. up, I love the honesty and yes, you know, the uh, yeah, the humour. So in your, uh, you know, your medical school and your surgical training, uh, most people have mentors. And, you know, when I was refreshing my mind about you and, um, you know, coming up to this, um, you know, it struck me that at that time, it was something of a golden era for Leeds. Um, you know, both of the main hospitals were vibrant and, had you know um, pleasantly competitive um, approaches to, and they had you know they had their own iconic surgical figures, you know Gallagher and David Johnson and Jeff Giles and 
and the Smitties and, you know, Brennans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I mean, of course, it's easy to be wax lyrically about nostalgia, you know, back in the day. But it, I mean, I think there's some basis to saying that it was a pretty golden era, wasn't it? Oh, I was enormously lucky, actually, for my career path, as it were, because I, as you say, I trained initially in London. And to be frank, you didn't get the surgical exposure in London. And I determined that I needed to get out and get further experience. And I went to Bristol and that's where I met David Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I'd only been there. I was working for him, actually, uh, as his lecturer. Um, And um, he, within three months, he said he was going back to uh, Leeds, uh, where he'd been a reader in Leeds. Mm -hmm. And we'd had a lot of conversations up to that point, um, whereby uh, we had discussed sphincter saving mm-hmm. procedures and the concept and uh, et cetera. And um, he said, um, well, I'd quite like you to come to Leeds with me and do so- to some of this research. <laughs> and uh, I had a very difficult conversation with my wife, who's from London, um we were living in bristol as i said and um she'd gone to leeds university uh but didn't really want to go back yeah happy yeah. happy in the south anyway the rest is history and we did go back and i was very lucky that uh that david and i got on very well he he was brilliant and had lots brimming with lots of ideas also John Golliger, as you mentioned, he just stepped down, but I actually did assist him in the private sector from time yeah. to time. And that was an enormous education. You mentioned Jeff Smitty, who, as we all know, was a hell of a character. Um, but I, I was also, uh, I got on the good side of uh, Jeff, <laughs> actually. And he, he taught me a fair bit about actually, not so much in the operating theatre, but actually, um, politics, he was quite good at that, um, quite abrasive at times. And uh, that taught me some t- quite a lot not to be abrasive. You can get what you need by being a bit more diplomatic. But anyway, that was that was an education. And um, you're absolutely right. There was this sort of friendly rivalry between the two institutions. But I was fortunate also that Jeff Giles was a very, very good friend of um, one of my family. Right. And, and uh, he, I thought he was great. And he also got on very well with David Johnson. Yeah. Um, so they, were, they worked together very harmoniously. So I, didn't, I wasn't so much embroiled in the friendly rivalry, in inverted commas, uh, that sometimes got a bit, you know, as you know, John, over the top. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I was working in Jimmy's when um, John Golliger turned up one day and had said to Jeff Giles um, that uh, would it be okay if when he retired, Jeff would look after his private patients? Because at that point, I think he was, um, he probably wasn't talking to DJ at that point, um, you know, yeah, what, yeah, one of yeah. the times, you know, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember um, he turned up one day and, and Jeff's secretary, Dorothy, who, of course, was was um, was um, uh, Gallagher's ex-secretary, was very excited. And Gallagher turned up to say, so he he was retiring because, as you know, he, he if he said he was retiring on the first of the month, he did. He didn't. It was no, he was very rigid like that. And um, so Jeff said, oh, oh okay, I'm good. Uh, that's fine. And he said, and you look after the patients, will you? Um, and Jeff said, certainly. And he disappeared. And about three hours later, Jeff got a call from, I think it was the Nuffield or whatever was the private hospital, um, to ask Jeff, would he be doing a ward round? Um, to which Jeff said, what do you mean? Um, and Gallagher had done his entire list, including a pouch the day before, right. and, and left this floor full of patients, <laughs> which right. wasn't at all what Jeff um, had uh, anticipated. But of course, that was... as I say, I was very lucky actually, because um, as you know, David Johnson had 
was a basically an upper GI surgeon. Yes, yeah. You know, because he developed highly selective agotomy. Didn't really, uh, uh, we did, none of us realized that that was a dying operation, mm -hmm. as it were, because it would be super, um, it'd be taken over by drug medication, subsequently H. pylori medication. Um, but so we went back to Leeds and I think David realized that he had to have a bit more strings to his bow and he was taking over Golliger's practice and he didn't have the bandwidth to, to, to do the research around the colorectal. And I was there as his research fellow and it was the, just the most amazing, you know, experience because there was so much um, uh, uh, stuff that Golliger had left behind that I could mine. I was incredibly yeah. fortunate because John Golliger was an incredibly, as you say, very precise man. And he kept every specimen that every rectal cancer that had been removed had been pickled and it was in the department. It was in a storeroom. He probably couldn't do that now no. uh, no. without whether or not he had permission to do it. I don't know, but uh, things were different in those days. And so I was able to do a really very important piece of research on those specimens, looking at distal spread. I and remember. Recall reducing the uh, margin and being... Mm -hmm. Because people were reducing the, yeah. um, the the margin distally to the rectal cancer, and it was crucial to know whether this was safe or not. And I, I was very fortunate, and I spent hours, you know, dissecting these and very carefully looking at uh, the spread. And um, you know, that's, so that was just an example of, and there was so much other material. Uh, that you could mine, um, and I was very lucky. I, uh, we 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 did some fantastic stuff, um, and um, you know, I, I, so I was so lucky. And then I got a call, <laughs> when I, you know, after about so I was I went to the states first on a Fulbright scholarship yep. that David organised for me. I went to the States um, and to work with Grossman, Mort Grossman, who you recall established gastroenterology as a journal. Yep. And interestingly, always signed off his ref referee's reports with his name, which is highly unusual these days, as you know, and then came back to Leeds and uh, was appointed senior lecturer. Remained a senior lecturer for three and a half years, and really, because I had that, and it was a fantastic experience in the states in LA, UCLA, because I learned so much about research. Um, because Morton Grossman was a fantastic mentor and um, very precise as well, and really taught me to be forensic um, about what I did as far as research was concerned. And um, so then I was able to uh, use those lessons in Leeds. Um, and then after three and a half years, and <laughs> I uh, got this call from my alma mater where I trained. Um, and uh, they asked me if I was interested in the chair. There. Um, and to cut a long story short, um, I did apply for it. Not really. I wasn't absolutely sure, but it, I once I had a look at it, I realised it was absolutely fa fantastic, going to be a fantastic experience, and I could see nothing but development. I mean, it it had, was down on on its uh, luck, as it were. Its previous the previous professor there, who will remain nameless, um, had been uh, the dean. And uh, he had uh, been, um, he'd become an alcoholic, sadly. And he'd actually been forced out of his role. Um, and so they hadn't had anybody as professor of surgery there for a year. And the department had really, you know, suffered. And I was able to come in, and the only way was up, really. Yeah. I was able to yeah. develop, you know, develop the department. That was that was fantastic as well. I'm using the term fantastic a lot, I realise. <laughs> but um, 
it's uh, it does you know i as i say i've been incredibly lucky out through my career being in the right place at the right time which is you know you well know, you know it's um if you if you're a follower or a reader of um uh of the work um by um i'm totally blanking on his name it'll come to me in a minute um a canadian writer um who you know discusses the uh, uh the alliance between opportunity and skills you know i mean you have to have the skills but you need the opportunity um and to put together and uh you know the the opportunity does um you know, presented itself and you made the most of it um do you you um the others you know you obviously the record attests to the fact that your academic uh, stint in uh, as chair and barts and then the royal london etc um was very successful that you became politically active quite quickly in medical politics and rose up through was that something you always wanted to do or was it again opportunistic well well i think you you say that but i didn't become politically active till well into my career what quite near towards the uh, you know when i was about i suppose in my 50s right um i i i realized that you know if you're going to make big changes um yeah we look at, we look after a lot of patients obviously in your career you do and you know but how do you affect you know thousands or even millions of patients lives and the only way really is to be politically active um in, in with a small p really um and there are different ways of, of, of approaching that um but i did get involved in medical politics i did think it was important for the profession not just for surgery but initially for surgery um i saw that obviously that was my domain and i um got elected to the council of the royal college of surgeons i have to say of england um because as we all know there are various royal colleges um and um that was uh, i felt you know where i could influence things and make a difference and um uh, move things forward in our profession uh, certainly in the uk um and i hope to some extent because the royal college has influence uh, elsewhere in the world um you know I'm, and i like to think i made a very small contribution in that direction as we all do because we all stand on the shoulders of course of giants uh, sure. and sure. i've always felt that you know, and and also you as an individual have has to be part of a team sure uh, so i i i think it's very interesting that you make those comments about if you want to you know as a surgeon you can influence the life of a, of an individual but you know politics in, uh, influences the lives of thousands um i've had a similar conversation about politics permitting you to allow af- affect the lives of many more with aradarzi um who of course followed a, a a political pathway what you were alluding to the alternative political pathway not through the colleges but through mainstream politics yeah, um yeah, yeah. and you know i've said to him i mean i was one of my oldest friends in in surgery so so i feel able to say to, and i am doing this interview with him at, um shortly but um uh I, you know what i've said to him is but you know do you think that's really true in that you affect change because when you get into any form of politics it, part of that is compromise the art of compromise to achieve anything you have to compromise um and you know when you start compromising you give up certain things and um w- what's been your experience about that you think the juice is worth the squeeze uh yes i definitely do think and i think you can influence um the decision makers at the top of the tree um if you play your cards right um and i think if you're rational and you have evidence and it, and you really do have to present people with evidence that they can't refute or find it difficult to refute then you can persuade them in the right direction but it has to be done subtly and i don't think 
I think it's always best to approach people rather than I've seen various leaders, uh, particularly in the medical profession, uh, be somewhat antagonistic um, and, and, you know, thinking that by doing that, they can push people to do things. But in fact, I've found that they just throw up the walls and they become defensive and don't. So it's far better, in my view, to be in the tent um, and influence it in that direction. And that's been my experience. When I was fortunate to be elected president of the Royal College of Surgeons, that was how I believed it was right to act. And, and I made no bones about it when I put myself forward. And obviously people felt that was the right way to go. And I like to think that's how we did influence uh, matters. And when I also following my stint as president, um, I was surprised when the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, actually asked me if I would uh, help him uh, be a, a senior clinical advisor to him. Mm -hmm. um, and I did go into the Department of Health um, as his advisor, and I learned huge amounts. But it really brought home to me how important it was uh, to work with people, work with the civil servants and the ministers, and try and get them into the place that you felt was appropriate. Subsequently, your you know, your political journey after presidency, as you say, you're alluding to, has been somewhat different. Um, but um, is um, and you've continued to do it. Um, so yes, yes. when a when a rational person um, might be considering of you know painting landscapes and um, and you know playing golf or whatever, which I guess is a gentle way of asking, as I do many people, um, what your retirement uh, mindset is. Some people, you know, I was talking to Rob Madoff recently on one of these interviews, and you know he he literally having spent a stellar career in minnesota <clears throat> just simply stopped completely and moved to brooklyn to be closer to his kids and is adoring the access to museums and opera etc cetera, etc cetera. i was also talking to another surgeon uh, jim fleshman who you know who has no plans to retire um doing something until he, he thinks maybe until he's 80. Um, um, so what's your, where's your mindset in all of this? Well, first of all, I'm very lucky. Again, <laughs> luck's come into it because, I, as I say, I became president of college and I worked for the Secretary of State for Health, etc. And I keep getting asked to do stuff. Yeah. But it's not, it's not clinical. Yeah, it's, sure. It's um, utilising my... Uh, knowledge of how our health service works and I've broadened it you know so I've got a greater interest across not just surgery by any means public mm -hmm. health and uh, various other uh, aspects of it um, and I'm I've been asked to do them and it's very difficult you know when you get asked um, I'm doing a very interest I run a team I, one of my roles is to be chair of the um, national consultant information um, program uh, supplying in a confidential manner outcome measures of indi for individual clinicians directly to them um, and that's really fascinating yeah been really fascinating and we have a team of well we had a team about 30 um, and they're all a lot younger than me so it's very fascinating listening to them not just talking about what they're doing, but what they're not, where they're doing outside as well and how they interact with IT, et cetera. Um, so I'm doing that and I'm also chairing nationally what's known as the Independent Reconfiguration Panel here, which basically um, what when there is very contentious reconfigurations relating to the health service, um, then the Secretary of State gets involved they then, he then, or she, asks uh, us to, to have a look at that and give independent advice. So those are two quite large areas I'm involved in. But when you say, what's my mindset? 
Well, as you can see, I'm still working and I enjoy that. And when I stop enjoying it, I will stop. And I think you've got to know when to stop. Um, and for instance, I think it's really, I find it very difficult to understand why people go on operating for so long. Sure. I, saw it, yeah. I saw it, I've seen it for individuals who've gone on too long mm -hmm. and caused problems for their patients. And I think that's wrong. Um, and I think I've seen other people having to be told to stop. Mm -hmm. and I would have hated that. I would have hated that. But this sort of work is different. And I suppose you've got to, your brain's still got to function, but that's about all. You know, I mean, you can sit yeah. in your chair and not, you know, or you, you know, um, and give that advice. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it, there's an element of it that's a bit like the phenomenon that you're familiar with of the, the retired surgeon opining on medical legal matters 20 years after they last yeah, touched a patient. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. a, you know, I guess somebody could say, well, you know, somebody needs to stop Norman interfering with, you know, the health service. What does he know about it? He hasn't been in it for years. It's, I mean, it's at some point, but if yeah. when you do, yeah. when you do stop enjoying it and pack it in, what will you do with yourself? Um, so that's, I, a, that's a good point. I mean, mm. I think you do have to have a bit of a hinterland. I'm very lucky. I'm I'm very, you know, my wife is um, always makes sure I do other things, uh, which I'm interested in. I mean, you know, like the theatre, we're great film. You know, we love watching um, films, um, and I we you know I have a healthy lifestyle as well. I still go to the gym and work out there and we go, you know, walking and all the rest of it. Um, but I do think you need to have intellectual stimulation. And anyway, I'm hopeless at golf. Um, that, I, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do love sport. I'm a bit of a sports nut. Mm -hmm. So I, I watch a, too much sport. I have every single channel of sport you could ever think of. Um, I, my wife would say I would bat, I would bet Two flies going up the window, you know. Um, you know who would get there? Which one would get there quickest? But no, I'm not a gambler. But you know what I mean. Yeah, no, no, um, for sure. Yeah. So I, I um, played snooker for uh, one point, quite seriously in my younger uh, years. I uh, I was talking to John McPhee recently on one of these interviews, and and he oh. um he his he has a bit of a hobby of wood turning and doing right. strange things with wood. And he told me, although I, I have to take his word for it, that um, our esteemed colleague, uh, Pierre Guillou, is a, has become something of a, a tortured artist, painting, etc. cetera. I, I, I don't know that that's true or not, but that's what he said. No, no, that is true. He paints uh, Lake District, I think, a lot okay. of uh, right. stuff like that. Yeah, Pierre's an interesting man. Mm -hmm. uh, you well know. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, I, I was quite surprised when he stepped down uh, from his role, quite, quite a young age, relatively. Um, but I, they tell me he's very happy in what he's doing now. So that's and cool. I, yeah, I mean, uh, again, without um, uh, diverting into someone else, uh, I, I, I think he's. From, I think for most of his professional career, he was quite a tortured soul um, in some mm. respects, you know. So now he's a tortured artist. Yes, exactly, which is... <laughs> he probably you know... his whole life will be tortured. <laughs> I can't say I'm tortured. <laughs> so um, are you um, from the other side of the Atlantic and with the ability of the internet and one thing or another and talking to old friends and colleagues... One does not get the impression that the National Health Service and healthcare delivery in the United Kingdom is is um, on a high at the moment, shall we say. Are, are you optimistic for the future of the NHS or are you downcast about it? Um, well, I'm not the sort of person to be downcast. I've always been a person looking for uh, opportunity and I think we are, there's no question that we're going through a very difficult time. It's a very challenging time. And um, I think we have to have a conversation now. I think we've got to the stage where we need a national conversation as to what the NHS does 
how it does it and how it's financed. Um, and I don't think we should be frightened about that. Um, and I think we should be looking at other models. And indeed, it's you know there are various commissions now. Um, the, the the Times, the newspaper, is running a, a commission which uh, our colleague Ara Darcy, I understand, is on, and that's good. Um, and so I think, uh, and there are other. The BMA is running a commission as well, and I I would hope that we get, get to a consensus. But change is necessary. There's no perfect system. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you, you know you are at the other side of the Atlantic, and we all know. Uh, that it's not a perfect system mm. in the no, US. No. Mm. Absolutely. And mm. neither is it here. No. Um, but I do strongly believe in the concept, free at the point, you know, of delivery, as it were. I do believe in that very strongly. I was brought up in it and I, yeah. I've seen the other sides of it. And I would hate to the fact that you discriminate based on, um, you know, means of, of, of pay. Um, so I, I, but I do think, and we all know that health becomes, you know, it becomes more and more a greater proportion of GDP. Yeah. And there comes a point where you can't go on. And what's fascinating, of course, is that um, the personalized medicine is not a cheap option. No. Um, by any means. And therefore, as we pursue it, which we must, because that's going to be the secret of how we conquer uh, many diseases and cancer, you know, obviously being an important uh, one, then we are going to have to seek how we finance that. Um, and that's going to be a very important discussion. And um, I don't know what the answer is myself. I would... Um... And, and uh, I don't know, you know, as as Yogi Berra said, you know, predicting the future <clears throat> is um, always a problem because it's ahead of you. Um, yeah. But um, or something like that. Yeah, you, like that. you make the point that personalized medicine is not a cheap option. Um, I think there's some you know, I've been looking at some cancer data in the US. I think there's some reason to think that it might be a front loaded cost. Um, as it's it's expensive <clears throat> at the outset, but at five years, it's actually less expensive because certainly in cancer care, the expense continues as long as the treatment continues until the patient dies, um, whether it's chemotherapy and or surgery or whatever it might be. Whereas, uh, and so there's there's a couple of examples where, you know, some of the main centers are the most expensive within 90 days, but at five years are the least expensive because it's more effective. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> that's a, an interesting argument. And I don't, mm. I'm sure you're right. But if you look at it from a public health perspective, the longer you keep people alive, uh, the more comorbidity they get. Yes. Uh, the course. more expensive it gets, so yeah. it's not. It's not. No, <laughs> not no. Are you right? Really, you're right. You know? It's. Um, um, so I think you know, and people talk about prevention, and I'm a great one for prevention. I think you need to cut your obesity levels and mm -hmm. your type two diabetes and all the rest of it. And I would really, you know, I think you need to invest there. Any system needs to invest there, but you know, you are then prolonging life. Sure. Um, and every time you prolong life, it, you know, there's, a, there's an expense against that. So, you know, and uh, prevention, as we all know, if you just look at our area, colorectal, and you look at um, fecal occult bug monitoring and uh, screening, you create, create work. And, you know, although our screening is cost effective, you have to still invest quite a lot. So if oh, you go sure. and start yeah. preventing other yeah. other diseases, you are going to raise costs just to uh, um, diagnose them, and you know scanning and all the rest. You know, so ain't, <coughs> it's uh, um, interesting. As uh, I a hundred percent agree with you that <coughs> in the UK there needs to be a national conversation. Um, about the fundamental principles of the NHS, a system that I also passionately believe in, 
at least in its underlying principles. But of course, it has it's never been entirely free at the point of delivery, and it's never been entirely universal care. But my the point I was going to make to you is that um, even though there needs to be a conversation, there has to be a conversation, as there does in the U.S., where the this the system equally broken. Um, requires a national conversation. Uh, you know, I may be, I know I'm cynical about this, um, but I actually do not believe there will be that conversation on either side of the Atlantic for one simple reason. Um, in the US, it's Democrats versus Republicans. They both understand the problems with healthcare equally well, but they're not willing or able to have the conversation because it's political death. And the problem in the UK is the first time anybody truly steps away from universal health care free at the point of delivery, regardless of the ability to pay, it's political um, death for them. And, you know, I've sat in when I worked in the UK and sat with ministers, etc. You can tell they know it. They they know they have to have the conversation. They know it's not sustainable but they just don't do it because it's dangerous. And, you know, maybe now's the time, but it's certainly, I've not seen it in 30 years. Um, and it's- No, well, I, 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 I share that view, um, but I think we're rapidly approaching a tipping point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just a question when, not if. Um, because if you're, you know, if you're basically spending all your GDP on health, which uh, could happen if you just let it go, go, you know, um, I think you'll have a problem. Yeah, as um, a, a CEO on, on this side of the Atlantic, who's quite a healthcare guy, he gave me a slide showing, you know, the exponential rise in GDP yeah. and healthcare yeah. expenditure. Yeah. And yeah. he said, there will come a point when the entire population is either a doctor or a patient, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or both, or both. Exactly. So, I mean, the few minutes we have left, Norman. Um, so, I have two questions for you. The first is, um, what would you, what advice would you give to the young aspiring Norman Stanley Williams if you mm -hmm. met him today at um, just graduating from medical school? I would say. This is the most amazing profession. Uh, there isn't a day that you practice that you don't feel good about something. And that's very unusual in any job. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to be really committed. Um, and if you're not really committed, then you shouldn't do it. You should pick a, a specialty that really, you know, enthuses you. Um, that you find intellectually stimulating. And I think you should also be always on, you know, open your mind to how you can make your specialty better than uh, when you started. And uh, if you can do that and even just affect it in a slight way, you know, that's an achievement. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, always be true to yourself and your patients. Yeah, and uh, be very open with your patients. Don't try and hide um, things from from them, um, because they trust you, and they trust you very much with their lives. And I think it's crucial that you um, live up to that trust. Did you? I don't know if you. Just a quick sidebar. I don't know if you had the opportunity to see or read or listen to or read the. Um, the book, um, This Is Going to Hurt. Um, yeah, with Adam Kay. Yes. Yes, I have. Um, so I, I just, you know, I'm, I know I'm behind the times, but I listened to the audio book of that just in the last week, actually. And it struck me that what, what you've just said is very true. It's, it's essentially what he says. You know, it's a wonderful profession where you get to do things you know, that you can't do in any other way. And it's so fulfilling. But the the message that just came through from his, his personal limited experience was the system just ground him down. It, it's not the patients, it's not the doctors, but the system. And what I see 
around the world in terms of people's retirement plans and disillusionment. It's, it's, they love the patient interaction, you know, and the ability to help a patient or make a little scintilla of a difference that day. <clears throat> but it's the, perf and, you know, Tony Young wrote that paper 20 years ago about early retirement in the NHS. It's the same now. And it's not just the NHS, of course, it's the system. Yeah, I mean, I can understand uh, the system, you know, getting the people. I, I mean, to be frank, I uh, when I, I remember vividly as a houseman, people saying the same thing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they said, I remember very well my boss going on Newsnight, which was a TV programme, and those days still going, actually. And he was interviewed as part of a panel of NHS people saying the morale is the lowest I've ever yeah. seen in the NHS. Mm. And that was 1971. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that you've got to keep that in perspective. Yeah, I agree. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the system can get to you and you have to make your own decisions about it. And people may say I'm a bit old fashioned in that regard. I think it's um, if you weigh up the pros and cons, though, for me, the pros are always uh, out, out yeah. to the, the con. Well, and if you, if you don't like the system, move to a system that you can. And that's why yeah. people, to be honest, a lot of our people are going yeah. to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, and, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, that's why both of us are still in the profession, of course, because the pros outweigh the cons. I mean, to me, what I noticed the difference between in the last 30 years... You know, working in the NHS in the 80s, you worked incredibly hard with limited resources. You did your best. And everybody understood that as the deal. But the, what's changed in recent years, I think, has been the introduction of blame. Nobody blamed the doctors when things didn't really go well, you know. And yeah. I, I think that's, uh, you know, everybody understood they were doing their best. So final question, Norman. How would you like to be remembered and how would do you think you will be remembered? Oh, God, that's a really difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> I look, I, I, I don't think I can answer that. It's for others to answer, uh, you know, whether I've... Um, I, I, I think, you know, how would I like to be remembered? There's just a person who did the very best they could, who looked after patients to the best of his ability, made certain people's lives better. And with the stuff I've been doing since you know, um, affected, uh, you know, as many people as I could to make their lives that bit better. Um, that's really all. And I think that, you know, that's the most you can do in your life, isn't it? I mean, just when you leave it, as it were, that you can look back and think, well, I did the best I possibly could. And I hope I influenced and made people's lives that bit better. That's all I can say. And then I think it's up to others um, sure. to decide. But, you know, we're, we're all we all move off uh, the stage um you know some of us probably some people get remembered more than others but most of us don't you know yeah. we don't leave a big imprint behind the you know it's a bit like the snow isn't it footprints in the snow yeah i i agree with that I, you know uh, you know to go full circle um uh, as i'm sure you recall john Gallagher had written into his contract with Ballier Tyndall that his book would die with him. Yeah. Um, right. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, there's a, there's a, like a, a substantial generation or two of surgeons that simply do not know the name John Gallagher. Um, right. And, you know, when, when you had hair, I'm not sure when that was. Um, a long time ago. But, yeah. You know, nobody could have conceived that John Gallagher would be completely forgotten about, you know. No, it's um, bad, isn't it, in a way, but it is. Is, um, because that's the way of the world. Yeah, and, it is. I, think very, I mean, there are certain people who have uh, diseases named after them, operations <laughs> named after them, but, but, you know, who 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 wants... I, 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 well, I think you've got to have enormous ego, actually, to want that. Well, surgery is not devoid of enormous egos, you know. Um, no, no. Well, you've got to have a bit of an ego to do the job, to be honest. Uh, no, that's very true. I think that but you have to be very careful that that ego doesn't uh, step over the line and yeah. 
um, as we've all seen, some people, uh, you know, they do become very egotistical. <laughs> um, so, well, thank you so much, Norman. I really appreciate you spending the time. It's been fantastic chatting to you about random things. And my script of questions is in disarray at this point because we wandered around. But it's wonderful to see you and see you looking so well. I'm, I'm... Oh, thank you, John. And uh, I, it's mutual. I've enjoyed it. I've Surprisingly, I've enjoyed it. I mean, <laughs> when I said I've got this guy, I said to Linda, my wife, um, you know, this uh, guy, John, who I've known for years, is going to be interviewing me um, and we're just going to be chatting about and he's going to, you know, I'm going to be talking about myself. And I, I'm not sure I, I feel that comfortable about that. And she said, really? That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> talk about put, making you you know putting your feet back on the ground great to see you anyway look after yourself you too Bye. all the best <laughs>